So what I suggest you take away from this sort of subsection on logic is that you that you start testing the use of the words of reasoning and inferring. So in regular language, we use words like because and uh, words like um, um, it's caused by uh, or we could conclude that. And to lift that one uh, level higher, the word inferring um, indicates that, that you are actually, in terms of epistemology, looking at truth claims. And that makes the debate in your own text and with your supervisor even more clear. Especially when you can make a next elevation, a next level elevation by indicating that you just produce a deductive reasoning or that on inductive science done by others empirical research is a synonym it's clear that certain use of algorithms or technology is having these types of effects so that you name that as a plus package to the standard line that science proves ABC yeah, or uh, studies show that consumers are blah blah blah. Analyzing those studies in terms of logic gives the supervisor, reader, the sort of additional sense of okay, the student understands that this research was done inductively, that one was more abductively with hypotheses and statistics, that one was more deductive, and so legal research is deductive in most cases. So the, those are then sort of takeaways from such a philosophical description of the existence or description of the existence of deduction, uh, induction, abduction and the like. Maybe in a later stage in the tutorial we, we can fine tune this uh, square, but let's move to the next one, the ethics. Um, and the flavors are again not only four, maybe even ten, but the top four of ethical positions are in the number two. And the first one is that it's called deontology, and the key feature there is duty. So the ethical right thing to do is the thing that your duty instructs you to do. And then the next question is, where are the duties coming from? And then you have a whole spectrum, from the divine, from nature, or from law. So, I believe, in terms of assumptions, ethical assumptions, when you just finished your law degree, you're in this corner, and your reality, in terms of, or appreciation of ethics is, the law defines the duty, and that's all there is. And then, in certain countries on the globe, we have an additional line, and those laws are made democratically, so I feel connected to them. Give or take. So that's flavor one. <laughs> Next flavor is looking, not at duties, but at consequences. Utilitarianism. So the right thing to do is the thing that based on the calculations of all the options of possible actions produces a maximum of welfare for a maximum of people. And everybody in the duty corner is sort of jealous of the utilitarian corner. Because that feels so concrete, you can calculate how much typeface of general terms and conditions in GDPA terms of clicking OK is sort of producing most happy consumers. But both themes, both 
approaches, both labels, have a dilemma. The dilemma of duty is who's giving the instruction. Especially if, in the majority of the countries, including UK, a divine is regarded to be the ultimate source of the duty. So King Charles III is head of the church, and in the name of a divine, he is legislating our former EU citizens, mind you. So much for the division between state and church. So don't go to far-edged countries with prejudices, you know, Afghanistan, no, no, just around the corner. And the dilemma of the utilitarians is maybe even more crazy. Because you could argue that elderly people are not producing welfare for a maximum of people. So let's not give them food. If you're a true utilitarian, and that's all there is, that's your conclusion. Feels like a dilemma. Then we have virtue ethics, looking at excellence. So whatever good is, is defined as the best version. Important and famous examples. Um, playing flute, if you do it very well, to cite the colleagues of the introductory lectures in Harvard on YouTube, go there. And then that is, if you play flute well, that's excellent, that's a virtue, cool. If you're good in legislating, that's good. And the dilemma there is that it is very individual. So there's no general standard. It's just like with organism, as in, well, do your best, and that's okay. But all the dictators on the globe, they do their best. They have their ideals of a functioning society, even Mr. Putin. We don't like him, but he's a nice guy, and he tries to do the best for his country. So in terms of virtue ethics, he's cool. But still, our good feeling, the most mysterious thing we own as legal professionals, that wait a minute, Ernst von Bender is saying that Putin is cool, whoa, whoa, whoa. he's even recording it. <laughs> this thing. But according to the technical discipline called ethics in the subsection virtual ethics, how can you adjudicate if that is your framework? And then, last but not least, again, the consensus that and most likely that, that is not a ethics, but a variation of the world view, that we say, okay, let's good, let's call okay, good, excellent, the thing in terms of majority we agree on that it is good, with the dilemma that it can be anything. And in the past they didn't produce that just society, as mentioned earlier. So, the thing is that we don't like to discuss this. Because maybe we have to declare what our color is, which is perceived as very personal. Um, and if my claim is correct that jurists are on average duty ethics people, then we don't have an answer to the dilemma the philosophers identify. The dilemma, okay, prove me where are those duties coming from? Well. We have this sort of tradition called natural law. It's in nature. Okay, where? What's nature in the first place? And in, in the Netherlands, it's not very popular to say, well, but uh, there's a divine. Even in the UK, no one reads those pages in constitutional law. That there's no differentiation between uh, church and state. So, so we are uncomfortable. But my claim tonight is that your advices, your recommendations, are 100% based on your ethical views. When it comes to consumers, technology, algorithms. So I can point in your texts your 
sort of quasi-logical mixture, fusion kitchen, um, gin tonic mixture of all those flavors in the hope that no one notice and that your recommendation page is okay-ish. As in, okay, let's work on fostering the profitability of corporations, let's have maximum protection of consumers, let's have the rule of law and constitutional thingies be excellent and beautiful and dutiful and, and let's agree on that together. That's sort of, on average, the mixture we hope will fly. But if you actually talk to one of those addressees, they have difficulty in understanding you. And so this is a theme. And we are, we are not able to solve it tonight, and not in your thesis. But get ready that society will start asking these questions when they find out that you could have a conversation about it. So let's move to square five and six, doing the actual research and writing your thesis. Because these are sort of the preliminary considerations where on average we run away of. And here I summarize on the fifth square the actual laboratory work you will do, as in the research project that starts last week, as in that you will have a varied interaction with sources, specifically for your thesis, for the main courses in the Capita Selecta. And again, as introduced in the kick-off, you collect data, you start developing a focus, a research question, a reasoning, and then at certain stages you start describing, you start explaining, you actually start to forecast. And then already, based on your amazement or shock, the last page, the recommendation page, is sort of in the making too. Because if the starting point is shock, then most likely you will recommend change, if not transformation at the end. So those are all themes that at the same second are in your head and in your notes. Um, and the idea of the written part of the thesis is that you make a readable, understandable report on that. So the magic trick of thesis writing is not to attempt to produce all your ideas on one page and just take it step by step in my Taxonomy claims to be a sort of help, as in chapter one is an introduction, don't bother about that. Then chapter two is the description of the technology. Easy, just start describing, journalist. Chapter three is the description of the law, it's one of the possibilities. Just do your LB legal professional thingy. Law this, law that, case law, blah, 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 developments. And then chapter four is the analysis where you infer, you draw conclusions, truth claims. In that you answer the research question and you're done because the fifth chapter is just a summary. And then the forecast and the recommendations are then sort of an additional sort of component in most um, things. One way of looking at writing is that it is part of rhetoric. This is the fourth time that we discuss Aristotle. No time to go over all the details. So hopefully in the tutorials or other sessions we have a chance. But I wish to um, share with you the taxonomy of Aristotle where it comes to writing. And he identifies, in terms of the species of writing, three stages in time. The past, the present, and the future. Which is basically my distinction, taxonomy of description, analysis, and forecast. 
And the beauty is that we know the words he used for those stages, because when you write about the past, it's called forensic. Think of criminal law, not our master, but when you write about the past, it's like a criminal case with a dead body. So your chapter two and three are dead bodies. Forensic writing. Where needed, look at the detective movie and look how the detectives approach sort of the evidence. Forensic autonomy, you know. And then the present is uh, um, in Aristotle's time ceremonial, but for us the um, uh, 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 analysis. And then the future is labeled by Aristotle and all his successor, deliberative. And the Greek original word is symbolicum. And our words symbols are derived from that. The correct pronunciation is? Symbolivros. <laughs> in the attempt of pronunciation. For me, important is that we see that our product are words, symbols. So we are traders in symbols. Convincing symbols, but symbols after all. Which is so beautiful. So we run from dead corpses in the forensic stage and driving cars and stuff to symbols of deliberation in the future. And again, where it comes to persuasion, again the words dialectic and apodeictic. So the having a conversation or proven fact. These are the ingredients, as in, this is the landscape. We try to have more precise words. We try to have better world views, but they are not available. So, accept it or not, but, but we are about description, explanation, forecasts, creating symbols, and societies rely on our symbolic words when it comes to advices, to coping, changing, transforming. Um, and in your research, these themes return. Um, and um, in the next lecture, there will be a translation from these more abstract approaches to the classic legal research methods by uh, Nadia Kortova, colleague. Um, and then the fourth lecture will further fine tune that in terms of actual research tips and, and other tools, including Zotero, the note-taking and citing software, uh, to actually produce a thesis. Ladies and gentlemen, for now, thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. <laughs>